Hi, I'm Stephen Downs. Welcome to my presentation, Ethical Codes and Learning Analytics, here at Eden on June 22nd, 2020. In this presentation, we'll look at the use of, ed of ethical codes to resolve some of the problems of ethics in learning analytics. Ethical codes are useful because they play a number of different roles with respect to learning analytics. For one thing, they may act as standards of conduct for uh, ethical researchers in learning analytics. They might also serve as a set of requirements for learning analytics projects. These should not be confused with legal requirements, which are put into law in order to govern the conduct of companies, but rather product or application specific requirements. Ethical codes can also specify principles and values that govern a learning analytics project. The use of ethical codes helps because it creates a sense of right and wrong that is understood by all practitioners in the project and it creates a mechanism for determining the limits beyond which a learning analytics project will not go. However, there are issues with using ethical codes, specifically what is the ethical code that people can agree on? What is the right code for learning analytics projects? And as we'll see in this paper, there really isn't any one ethical code that will do the job. The research for this paper is based not only on an analysis of the ethical codes that are needed for learning analytics projects, the, the issues and the concerns that are raised, but also a study of 73 different ethical codes that are in use in different professions. These range from academic ethics, teacher ethics, librarian research ethics, healthcare ethics, data ethics, market research ethics, journalism, IT professionals, and more. The areas were chosen by their relation to learning analytics. Each one of these can be said to offer a candidate for some of the principles that should govern learning analytics projects. The reason why ethics becomes an issue in learning analytics at all is because there are so many applications of learning analytics that are useful for educational institutions and for students themselves. These can be divided into six major types. Descriptive analytics, which allow people to create a dashboard or snapshot of the state of the affairs. Diagnostic analytics, which tell us something about why something is happening in a learning environment. Predictive analytics, such as, say, predicting the outcome of a student in a course, can be used to uh, make predictions. <laughs> Prescriptive analytics go beyond that and actually suggest a course of action. A recommender system might be an example of prescriptive analytics. Generative analytics are those that actually create new content. Deep fakes is an example of that. And as well, analytics that write content, for example, articles for the Washington Post. And finally, deontic analytics are analytics that actually help you determine what is right and what is wrong. This is Emma, who's decided to help me as I give this talk. As can be imagined by the range of applications of learning analytics, there are many ethical issues that surface. In a scan of the literature, I identified dozens of them. I've broken them down into a number of categories, including some that occur when analytics works, some that occur when it doesn't, and some broader social and cultural issues that it raises. When it works, it can do things like surveillance, facial recognition, eliminate anonymity, create a profile, etc., raising issues of privacy, security, trust, and the like. When analytics doesn't work, that might be the case where we get unreliable data, biased and misrepresentative data, also unre unreliable models, models that make predictions that we know are inaccurate for the population group that they're describing. 
racist analytics is a classic example of this. And then there are the broader social and cultural issues, transparency, explainability, accountability, keeping it, for example, a human in the loop or the right of an appeal for a person who is impacted by a decision made by analytics and more. This is just a very quick sketch of them. Now let me turn to the ethical codes themselves. As I said, there are 73 different ethical codes that I looked at. They have common among them, I guess, a focus on ethical issues. Here, what I'm talking about is what the purpose of the code is or what it's trying to accomplish. And there are different things that different codes try to do. Some emphasize the good that can be done by a practice and talk about good or quality or, or effective practitioners. Others talk about academic or professional freedom. The ability of a reporter, say, or a professor to determine what's the content, what's being pursued. Many ethical standards focus on conflict of interest, the neutrality of the person involved, the idea that the person who is ethical puts the needs of their client first. Other codes are most concerned about avoiding harm or non-malevolence, as, as the uh, formal presentation goes. This is the idea of making sure that research subjects are not hurt by the research that's being conducted. Others focus on the quality and standards and especially on limiting the profession to practitioners who are qualified or certified to practice in that profession. And then finally, some codes talk about the limits of analytics beyond which the practice should not go. And the recent pullback on facial recognition is a pretty good example of that. Now, in the pursuit of these different objectives, and remember, the codes vary in these objectives, there are core values or priorities. Sometimes they're explicitly stated in the code. Other times they have to be kind of inferred by what is prohibited in the code. If, for example, a code says you shall not violate confidentiality, that leads us to believe that confidentiality is a value or priority being expressed by the code. There are 16 of those. Here are the first eight. Pursuit of knowledge, autonomy and individual value, that is the value of an individual person or the inherent worth of a person. Consent, integrity, that's you know truth and honesty confidentiality, care, and, and various descriptions of care, competence and authority, and value and benefit. And what that means is that the research is ethical only if it produces some kind of social value or research benefit. Here are the next eight. Non-maleficence. That's the modern adaptation of the principle, do no harm. It's adapted because in some cases, professionals do do harm. A surgeon will cut into a person. Uh, an educator might uh, reward a student with a poor grade. So the idea here is to do no more harm than you have to do in order to provide some sort of beneficence. That is, some good, curing the patient, educating the student. Other core principles include respect, that's respect for the decisions that are made. That's respect for uh, the informational needs of a person uh, and respect generally. Democracy is also a core value or priority underlying many principles uh, of uh, ethics in the professions. For example, uh, the public service. As well, we see justice and fairness. And I tend to group these together because ever since Rawls came out with a theory of justice, we've thought of, at least in the common discourse, of justice as fairness. Although, of course, there are other ways that you can say what justice is. You know, justice might be, uh, you know, getting what's due, or 
retribution, etc. Uh, fairness as well can be defined in many different ways, and it plays out in many different ways in the different ethical codes. Accountability and explicability are also core values and priorities for many ethical codes. Just being able to say what you've done and why you've done it and justify it in some way. Openness is also a consideration. Uh, some explicitly advocate open content. For example, you see librarians have a code requiring access and free uh, uh, free access to resources and information. Journalism as well promotes openness. And finally, common cause and solidarity are among the core values and priorities also contained in many ethical codes. One thing that's not mentioned in a lot of the literature on ethical codes and learning analytics is the different obligations that professionals have to different groups. Now you can see a list here of 10 or so different groups that a person might be obligated to. The first of these is the self. And some ethical codes talk about the need to maintain your professional development or the need to maintain or cultivate a, a virtuous character. Others talk about the need to conduct oneself honestly with respect etc again maintaining a professional attitude in the world another category of obligations is to the less fortunate and to be honest i couldn't find that in the ethical codes that i looked at i included it here because it is mentioned as a duty by peter singer in his writings about ethics and it may come up in some future code so i reserved a category for that but generally we don't see in codes of ethics a responsibility to the poor the indigent uh, the the people who need our help but who are outside of the specific help provided by a profession other ethical codes and especially uh, academic codes talk about a duty to the student both to help them uh, you know, graduate or pass or learn something, but also to become a better person, a contributing valuable member of society. Many codes talk about a duty to a parent or guardian, and also some about a duty to children, especially to protect children from harm, even harm by other people. And the duty to a parent or guardian might not just include informing them and keeping them up to date and having them consent, but also to not undermine their parental authority. And we see this in some, but by no means all codes of ethics. Many professional codes talk about a duty to one's client. And this is often expressed in the sense of putting the needs of the client before the needs of the self. Research ethics often talk about an obligation to the research, research subject making sure they uh, provide informed consent, making sure that they can halt the research, making sure that they're kept informed and apprised of the progress of the work. Other obligations are to one's employer or funder, and sometimes this runs contrary to the interests of the research subject, which creates you know, some more complex ethical decisions to be made by the professional. Other ethical to codes talk about duties to one's colleague, one's union, one's profession, to you know, represent them well, to not uh, you know, bring them into disrepute, etc. Sometimes to propagate the values of the association or the ethics followed by the association. A number of codes of ethics talk about duties to stakeholders. We see this a lot in legal or governmental codes of ethics. Stakeholders isn't always defined, and it's one of these slippery concepts. It originates from the original term stockholders, uh, and it's the idea that, like stockholders, there is a wider range of people who have an interest in some project or process. Some codes of ethics, say librarian ethics, talk about a duty to publishers and content producers. 
Others talk about, you know, respecting copyright, not plagiarizing, crediting people for work that they've done, etc. A few codes, but not very many, talk about a duty to wider society. And it's interesting because the potential harms to society are among the most pressing issues in learning analytics. And yet there are very few codes of ethics that actually talk about avoiding harms to wider society. Some codes talk about a duty or an obligation to obey the law, which raises issues if the law is unethical. And others assert a duty to one's own country, perhaps the democratic nature of the country, or in other cases, the multicultural nature of the country, or in other cases, the single unifying culture of the country. Finally, in very few cases, there is a duty mentioned to the environment. Now, the reason why these ethical codes differ in so many ways, and you know, very few of them, well, none of them have all of the uh, values and priorities that I've listed. There's some overlap, but there's no single set of values and priorities shared by any of these ethical codes. And the reason for that is they're based on different types of ethical principles, the different foundations. And here are some of the foundations. They're not always expressed in the codes themselves, but are usually expressed in the preamble to the code or sometimes in explanatory notes. One thing that a number of codes, including codes for analytics, suggest is that they're simply expressing universal codes. Now, we've seen so far that there aren't really universal codes. There aren't really universal values and principles that these ethical codes can appeal to, but nonetheless, that's what they say. Other ethical codes talk about being founded or based in fundamental or natural rights. Sometimes these can be explicit, as, say, in the United States Bill of Rights, but something like the Bill of Rights obviously does not apply all the way around the world. Others simply leave this statement of natural rights uh, just as that, and they don't describe in greater detail what those might be. Other ethical principles are based in fact, uh, facts about the world, facts about the nature of people, facts about uh, what the consequences of an action are, things like that. This obviously varies quite a bit from principle to principle. Other ethical principles, and especially those produced by governments or legal agencies, talk about balancing risks and benefit. Now, it's interesting because what counts as a benefit very often differs in the eye of the beholder. And that's why the obligation part that I mentioned just a few minutes ago is so important. Different obligations define different benefits. Others are founded in the requirements of the profession. For example, in order to be a librarian, says the code, you need to support free access to information for everybody in society. Or, in order to be a medical doctor, says the code, you need to harm the person as little as possible and help the person as much as possible, etc. So the idea here is that the profession and the ethics of the profession are a self-contained system. Other foundations are social good or social order that Ethics is required in this profession in order to preserve, it might be democracy, it might be social cohesion, uh, it might be you know advancement of knowledge in society. Some kind of social good is what justifies the specific ethical practice of this profession. Other principles of ethics are based in fairness. This might be you know, the allocation of scarce medical resources needs to be done fairly, or it might be justice needs to be allocated fairly, or students need to be treated fairly, etc. And then the, there are different ways, though, of defining fairness, although a lot of the time they just say fairness. Epistemology is another one, that is to say, what you know. 
consequentialist theories of ethics require an epistemology because they're based on what a reasonable person would predict the consequences of an act or a principle or a practice actually are. Uh, again, the consequences might vary based on the beholder and a good consequence for one might be a bad consequence for another. But whether or not they're good or bad, the question is, could they have been predicted? Trust is another basic value or principle. Uh, the idea is that trust is required to make the world go round, as they say, to support society, or is just a good thing generally. Finally, defensibility, that is to say, what behavior or practice your union or association would defend you in doing. So I said at the start of this presentation that I'd be talking about the difficulty in coming up with an ethical code for learning analytics. And, and here we, we see the reason why. If we address ethical issues in learning analytics, we're just adding another code to the pile of ethical codes. There isn't a single set of values or principles that unifies all of these ethical codes and can be used as guidance. No code, none of the ones that I studied and probably none in existence, address all of the issues. All of the issues that I've identified in learning analytics and all of the issues that I've identified that ethical codes attempt to address generally. And even when they do address an issue, they very often don't actually address the issue. They don't resolve the issue. For example, a code might address an issue of confidentiality, but then there are exceptions to confidentiality. There are con conflicting principles, uh, conflicting uh, obligations, and the code doesn't actually tell you how to resolve those. There's also the distinction between ethics and law. And what I mean here is a lot of these codes have enforcement mechanisms. Might have a review, uh, institutional review board, for example, um, an ethical review process, or even sanctions in the profession or in actual law. And if it's a law, it's not ethics, it's a law. Uh, there's a distinction between what the ethics of something are and what the legal status is. Ethics are thought to go beyond law um, but that gives us a need for a particular reason to obey this rather than that set of ethics. Sometimes it's just we sign the piece of paper saying that we would. And then, of course, sometimes the law goes beyond ethics. Uh, it might be amoral in some cases, and in others it might actually be immoral. There's also no, cons uh, no consensus on the principles you know, I listed 16 of these principles. There's no consensus on these principles in the sense that no two codes of ethics contain all and only the same set of principles. And it's funny, even, uh, you know, you might get, you know, a universal code of ethics for such and such a profession. I saw that for librarians, for example, and for some other professions. And then individual ethics for different country association. It's, it's like the world of standards where you'll have a single central standard and then an application profile. And these application profiles vary from place to place. So even where they begin with a consensus, you find that every particular application of these is different. Often the principles are conflicting, you know, Confidentiality versus openness, for example, uh, is, is an obvious one. Even where there is consensus, let's suppose, uh, any consensus would be minimal. Uh, it would be the smallest subset of all the ethics. And really, that would be pretty insufficient. You know, suppose the only ethical principle that we all agreed on is uh, you shouldn't kill people. Well, that's not going to be a sufficient statement or code of ethics for learning analytics. It's just not going to be enough. Uh, 
There's no consensus on the foundation. Some of them are consequentialist. Some of them are risk benefit. Some of them are based in fundamental human values. There's, you know, the, the foundations are all over the map for these different principles. And in fact, looking at the individual principles, you see several different foundations being brought in at the same time. And then finally, there's the problem of compliance. Why would anyone follow these principles of ethics? What makes them do that? Is the fact that they are a code of ethics sufficient to have somebody follow them? I would argue that they're not. And that takes us to the final points of this presentation. So as I said at the top of this presentation, I don't think that the ethical issues facing learning analytics can be addressed with an ethical code. And the reason is apparent for, for you to see. Uh, there is no commonality in ethical codes across the different professions to draw on. There's no set of principles that everybody's going to agree on. Ethical codes are going to be very particular and limited in their application. And they are fundamentally going to depend on ethical people. And you don't create ethical people by giving them ethical codes, just like you don't create mathematicians by giving them facts about mathematics. People need to learn to be ethical, and they need, need to learn to be ethical in much more subtle and personalized ways. Now, that goes beyond the scope of this presentation, but you know it gives us something to think about as we think about the need for ethics in learning analytics and as we think about the need for ethics in learning generally and learning in ethics generally. I'm Stephen Downs. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have.